What do you think of when you think of creativity? Great artists, writers, philosophers. Maybe something inspirational or spiritual. Maybe even magical. Perhaps it's these more mystical concepts that fosters an association between creativity and the natural landscape, culturally reconfiguring it as a place where you can find a deeper connection to yourself. But far from romantic notions of finding ourselves or grand ideas of divine artistry, Ben Wheatley reveals a surprisingly troubling side of creative endeavour, particularly in relation to relationships in his dark comedy Sightseers. Taking a uniquely British road trip around iconic historical sites and tourist traps, Tina and Chris explore their developing relationship while equally trying to escape the restrictions of the lives they're temporarily leaving behind. Throughout the film we are introduced to various expressions of creativity, most obviously in Chris's ambitions as a writer, but also Tina's knitting, her mother's art, Ian's writing, Martin's inventing, and even more abstract or spiritual creativity associated with rituals, festivals, and cultural tradition. But as this language of creativity and self-expression is applied to, say, less wholesome activities, it begins to emerge not just as a language of romance and freedom, but also of exercising power, as, for anyone who challenges Chris and Tina's claim on the places they pass through, well... Report that to the National Trust, mate. With its evident focus on the beauty of the British countryside, Sightseers initially seems to evoke the classic association of creativity and nature, reflecting the sentiment of many philosophers and artists such as Henry David Theroux, who stated that it is the marriage of the soul with nature that makes the intellect fruitful and gives birth to imagination. But England's history is tied up in the landscape of the film, and equally the caravan follows its colonial past, imposing the traveller's home and identity onto each environment. Like the thread that traces the impending journey in the opening scene, owning each pin by wrapping around it, a caravan stakes a claim of ownership rather than the simple transient inhabitancy that might have come with a tent or a hotel room. Even the dashboard toy, taken as a kind of morbid souvenir from Chris's first on-screen murder, draws the connection between tourism and something more invasive and destructive. While the locations range from sites of historical significance such as Fountains Abbey to more mystical settings like Castle Rigg Stone Circle, at each place Chris is equally compelled to make it his own, a symptom of the need for control that comes to define his character. And it is also Chris that shows great knowledge of and interest in caravans. Through this choice of vehicle and lifestyle we see that Chris is searching for a place of belonging, but he is more interested in warping that place to fit his pre-existing environment than he is willing to embrace it. Like most of Wheatley's films, such as Kill List and A Field in England, there's a conflict of urban and rural settings, the domestic against the untamed, that emerges as Chris and Tina travel further and further from civilization, further from home, and romantic ideas of nature begin to turn into something more primal. These ideas of primality, inspiration and personal intuition are similarly pertinent to the mythology of creativity, particularly in the idea of a muse, a concept that is frequently discussed in the film. The origin of the muse, that is, the nine Greek muses of literature, science and the arts that were considered the source of inspiration and knowledge, evokes an interesting idea of control in relation to creativity, as something that is channeled and harnessed but that also defines the creative act, in some ways taking power, or at least responsibility, away from the artist. This is paired with the contemporary understanding of the muse, that of the silent, subservient figure, commonly female, seen throughout art history, from Elizabeth Sedal, who you might recognise from many pre-Raphaelite paintings, to Dora Maar, who, while being a photographer, painter and poet herself, is best known as the muse of Pablo Picasso. In identifying Tina as the muse, Chris defines her only in relation to himself and how she can serve his own needs, a way of keeping control of their relationship. You're going to be in the driving seat in the car with me. Well, I'm not driving, I mean in the passenger seat. I'll do the driving. But as Tina begins to act on her own, the roles that Chris determined become unstable and his loss of control gives way to a more anarchic representation of primal creativity. Yeah, you're a witch. You're a bloody witch. This isn't the first time Tina has been associated with witchcraft, with the vanilla fudge cover of the Donovan song Season of the Witch acting as the soundtrack to her first murder. And combined with the invasive drum circle music and blood sacrifice rituals, it reveals a conception of creativity that is fundamentally in opposition with what Chris is trying to cultivate. I need structure, organisation, this is just chaos. 
As Chris and Tina drive to their final destination, we learn on the radio that they have been identified as suspects in the Hem Party murder. Both director Ben Wheatley and writer Alice Lowe, who also plays Tina, have described her as being a better murderer than Chris. But she's wanted by the police after just one murder, whereas Chris seems to have gone unnoticed for quite some time. So how is better being defined, if not in terms of getting away with it? Well, while it can be said that Tina's motivation for killing the girl in the pub and Martin is the same as Chris's motivation for killing Ian, jealousy, it is to an entirely different effect. Chris kills to feel in control, whereas Tina kills to lose it, and in doing so manages to let go of everything she's been trying to escape something Chris is never able to do. But this is by no means the film's final message on creativity, as these themes are expressed perhaps most interestingly in the very idea of relationships. Because it's just about personal empowerment, isn't it? It's just expressing yourself. Here we see that Tina understands Chris's motivations, but like Chris's need to exert his own power and domination, it comes from an equally isolating and narcissistic perspective. This is again reflected in the British landscapes that themselves increasingly dominate the film's cinematography. But rather than drawing on the land's history, this time it is the environment itself that mirrors how the characters use and perceive creativity. Being both beautiful and inspiring, but also isolating and dangerous. Alice Lowe has suggested that, like a grotesque parody of the hero's journey as depicted in classic literature such as Homer's Odyssey, all the people they meet on the way are almost fairy tale like trials for their relationship, and the ways they dispense with them are metaphors for how they deal with the outside world and its challenges. Being too preoccupied with self centered ideas of individual empowerment and expression, neither Chris nor Tina are able to deal with these trials in their relationship, instead, choosing to forcibly and violently remove the problem. This brings us back to the issue of the muse, the roles and relationship of the muse and the artist, a relationship that is built on unequal partnership. Whether Tina is the muse to Chris, as he states, or Chris is the muse to Tina, as he appears to become, they remain in these unequal roles that evidently cannot be sustained. But the muse-artist relationship can be considered differently, as proposed by essayist Sarah Parker in The Lesbian Muse and Poetic Identity, where she suggests that the relationship is more accurately described as a flexible triangle, in which roles are shared and exchanged. This triangular model means that it is entirely possible to have two poets, two muses, and various other combinations. While the muse has always been a figure of inspiration, Parker's new reading turns the muse into a figure of collaboration, where the relationship with a living muse is an ever-evolving dialogue that is constantly in process, something that Tina and Chris never achieve. The image of the burning caravan that marks the final sequence of the film remains as the ultimate symbol of both freedom and destruction, as well as the immense difficulties in navigating the two. There's a compromise that must be reached between personal freedom and the consideration or collaboration of others. This is the final association in the film's settings, the tension that exists in these historical sites between primal mysticism and the status quo, between chaos and control, individual and collective, is the real struggle of creativity. And the framing of the film's exploration, the road trip or holiday, is indicative of the temporary and unsustainable nature of both Chris and Tina's approach and that, at some point, we have to come home. Hey everyone, thank you all so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Ben Wheatley is probably my favourite contemporary director right now, so I'm sure I'll be covering his other films in the future. But for now, please do leave your thoughts down in the comments to continue the discussion and I'll hopefully see you next time.